Is it possible for a person to repent after taking the mark of the beast? What happens to those that take the mark of the beast? Although all have sinned, we are given a chance to repent. Is that the same when it comes to the mark of the beast? This is a question we just had to cover, as we have received numerous comments about this on this YouTube channel. We've rarely seen this kind of unanimous feedback. Explaining the subject involves addressing three complex puzzles. Let's break them down into simpler terms and discuss how they relate. Puzzle 1. What is the Mark of the Beast? The Mark of the Beast is a sign that will be placed on a person's forehead or right hand during the end times, symbolizing allegiance to the Antichrist. Furthermore, no one will be allowed to participate in commerce without this mark. Revelation 13:17. It seems that receiving the mark is associated with some form of worship of the Antichrist. Revelation 14.9 and 16.2 And those who refuse to worship the image of the beast will face execution. Revelation 13.15 The question arises as to whether a person who has received the mark of the beast can be forgiven. The answer to this question appears to be no. Revelation 14 verses 10 through 11 discusses the fate of those who take the mark of the beast, stating, he will also drink the wine of God's wrath, poured full strength into the cup of his anger. He will be tormented with fire and sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. The smoke of their torment will go up forever and ever, and they will have no rest, day or night. These worshippers of the beast and its image, and whoever receives the mark of its name. The eternal destiny of those who take the mark of the beast is the lake of fire. But why is taking the mark of the beast considered a grave sin against God? Why would God condemn someone to hell for making this choice? It appears that receiving the mark of the beast represents a blasphemous act of willful defiance against God. Accepting the mark is fundamentally an act of worshiping Satan. Those who choose to take the mark have opted to serve Satan rather than obey God and accept Christ as their savior. During the tribulation when people make this decision, God will grant their request to be eternally separated from him. What will happen to those that refuse to take the mark of the beast? Many will be surprised. It will lead to financial ruin. What happens to those who refuse to take the mark of the beast? Imagine a future where everyone follows the Antichrist. Fred is an ordinary guy with a simple life but he struggles to buy or sell anything because he hasn't accepted the mark. He finds himself torn. He doesn't want to become like the outcasts who refuse the mark of the Antichrist. Those outcasts have to hide away and face immense hardships. After much deliberation, Fred decides to accept the mark. The process is quick and easy thanks to the Antichrist's prophet who has made it simple. Once Fred receives the mark, he realizes that he has turned away from the God of the outcasts and the Jesus they believe in, yet he feels ready to enjoy the benefits that come with his choice. Yes, it may seem very difficult to comprehend, but all that refuse the mark will be abandoned by society. Revelation 13 verses 16 through 17 As he compels all, the small and the great, and the rich and the poor, and the free men and the slaves to be given a mark on their right hand or on their forehead signifying allegiance to the beast, and that no one will be able to buy or sell, except the one who has the mark, either the name of the beast or the number of his name. Under the rule of the beast and his helper, everyone will receive a mark. Without this mark, no one will be able to participate in the economy. People will not be able to buy or sell unless they have the mark of the beast's name. For those who do not receive the mark, all the money in the world will not be worth much. It will be like living the life of a fugitive. There have been many movies about running from the authorities, often depicting it as an exciting adventure, but is that what it's really like in real life? In reality, it's exhausting, stressful, and dangerous. You constantly have to watch your back, and if you get caught, people may perceive you as dangerous or believe you are armed, which can put you at risk of getting hurt. Additionally, those on the run will struggle to rent an apartment or allow someone to rent from them. Most of us don't realize how dependent we are on others. Can you imagine not being able to pay for basic utilities like electricity? Ultimately, the only protection you have is your own intelligence. You are completely on your own. Everything you need, you must provide for yourself. 
No one is there to comfort or protect you, leaving you utterly alone. Being an outcast is like being a runaway. It's really sad. Not like how TV shows make it look all fancy. When someone is on the run, they usually have to hide in dirty, rundown places. It's very lonely. You can hardly talk to or trust anyone. If you have family or friends, you can't see them because the police are probably watching them. You can't get a normal job from 9 to 5. You can't go home because your family and friends are being watched. You're always on the move, starting over in a faraway place. You're constantly scared of getting caught or being turned in by someone who wants the reward. That's the worst part. In one word, this life can be summed up as facing hardship. To endure doesn't just mean to smile and pretend everything is okay. Christians will feel sad, hurt, or even angry sometimes. We must remember that everything that happens in our lives is under God's control. He has promised that he is working everything out for the good of those who love him and are called to follow his plan. Jesus is the perfect example of someone who went through hard times. Hebrews 12, 2. The writer of Hebrews tells us to remember how Jesus stayed strong even when sinners treated him badly. Jesus, even with all the pain he faced, never gave up, not even when he was on the cross. However, there is a spiritual side to receiving the mark. Angels themselves step in, and the world is about to change for the outcasts and those that receive the mark of the beast. But something strange starts to happen. The world is hit with all sorts of disasters like floods and earthquakes. Then something even stranger happens. The mark on Fred's hand starts to hurt and smell awful. It turns into a terrible sore. No one can help. And everyone with a mark is suffering a lot. Some people are confused, but others know the truth. They understand what's really going on. The people on the outside see these events too. They know this isn't because of a global attack or a war. These people who are left out understand the real truth and have picked their side. Even though they faced a lot of pain, they see what's happening. They know that the Antichrist is a leader who wants to take Jesus' place. He was almost killed, but somehow healed. And everyone was tricked by him. So many people followed him without thinking. They also understand that the sores Fred and others are dealing with aren't from this world, but come from a distant place. These troubles come from the temple of God, way up in heaven. The temple of God in heaven is a mysterious place. Many people don't even know there is a temple in heaven. This temple is mentioned in the book of Revelation, chapter 11. When the temple is closed, it means a huge warning and judgment for the whole world. The worst ever seen or that will ever be seen. It will be the final judgment for the world. When the temple is first opened, many strange things happen. First, the Ark of the Covenant is found again. But everything is about to change. Seven angels appear in the temple and change everything. After these things I looked, and the temple, sanctuary of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was opened, and the seven angels who had the seven plagues, affliction, calamities, came out of the temple, arrayed in linen, pure and gleaming, and wrapped around their chests were golden sashes. Then one of the four living creatures gave to the seven angels seven golden bowls full of the wrath and indignation of God who lives forever and ever. And the temple was filled with smoke from the glory and radiance and splendor of God, and from his power, and no one was able to enter the temple until the seven plagues of the seven angels were finished. Revelation 15 verses 5 through 8. This judgment is very serious for heaven. In the last chapter, we saw how important it was to prepare for the pouring of the bowls. These angels are bringing God's judgment. They came straight from the heavenly temple, right from God's presence and throne. They're not doing this by themselves. They wear special cloths, pure bright linen with golden sashes around their chests. This shows us that even though judgments might seem harsh, they come from a fair and good place. It's easy to think that bad judgments come from evil sources, but this shows us something different. A big judgment is coming to the earth and no one can stop it because it comes from a just and righteous God. Yes, the Bible talks about evil angels who cause chaos and destruction, but that's not what's happening here. The Bible clearly says these angels are righteous and not fallen. The angels are given bowls, and God's glory fills the temple with a cloud. It's important to understand that people who don't believe might not see the coming judgment. This means that things happen in the spiritual world before they show up in our physical world. People can predict the weather, like when it will rain or which way the wind will blow. 
but God's ways are different. We can't figure out how God's temple works using science. We only know these secrets because God has told us, and this knowledge can give us comfort. Many Christians need to realize they already have answers to the world's big questions, including how everything will end. Heaven's order is perfect. One of the four living creatures near God's throne gives these bowls to the seven angels. John sees these four living creatures with many eyes in different shapes, a lion, an ox, a human, and an eagle. This shows that these judgments come directly from God's throne. When this judgment starts, no one is even allowed to enter the temple of God. This shows that heaven does not take this judgment lightly. Once this judgment starts, nothing can stop it. Heaven is all set, the temple doors are shut, the seven angels are ready, and people are all set to take these bowls. Then I heard a loud voice from the temple saying to the seven angels, Go and pour out on the earth the seven bowls of the wrath and indignation of God. So the first angel went and poured out his bowl on the earth, and the loathsome and malignant sores came on the people who had the mark of the beast and who worshipped his image. Revelation 16, verses 1-2 through 2. A voice comes from the temple. Could this be Jesus speaking? In Revelation, voices from heaven often represent Christ, but not always. Because people have wronged the earthly temple, now the judgment comes from the heavenly temple. These bowls deal more with human rebellion and cover more areas than other judgments did. Many of the bowls, like the trumpets, remind us of the plagues from the Exodus, painful sores, turning water into blood in darkness. By reminding us of these plagues, these judgments show that just as God protected his people in Goshen during the plagues, he will also protect them from his judgments. The last two bowls show the final battle and the completion of God's promises. The first bowl brings really painful and nasty sores to people who worship the image of the beast and have its mark. Those who follow God are not affected by this bowl. It's just for those who follow the Antichrist. This shows God's anger being poured out on people who were made on the sixth day, Genesis 1. Revelation 13, 18 says this is like the sixth Egyptian plague of boils that hits people with the 666 mark of the beast. Those who worship the creature instead of the creator. They will be ordered to be executed by the abomination of desolation. It seems that worshiping the Antichrist is linked to getting the mark, and anyone who refuses the worshiping of the beast will be put to death. Revelation 14.9 And he is given to give breath to the image of the beast, so that the image of the beast will even appear to speak and cause those who do not bow down and worship the image of the beast to be put to death. Revelation 13, 15. Jesus referenced a future event in Daniel 9, 27 when speaking about the abomination of desolation in the Olivet Discourse. In Matthew 24, verses 15 through 16, Jesus says, So when you see the abomination of desolation, the appalling sacrilege that astonishes and makes desolate, spoken by the prophet Daniel, standing in the holy place, let the reader understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains for refuge. The Bible is a history book, but it is unique in comparison to any other history book found in public libraries. It covers the entire history of the earth, starting from its creation to its end. No other book has been published which covers such a wide range of events on our planet. This is partly because nobody was present at the beginning to witness and document it, and thus nobody can write about the beginning of our world authoritatively. We are the only ones in the world who will know how it will all end, which is truly unique. The Lord didn't reveal the future just to satisfy our curiosity, but rather to prepare us for what's to come, so that we won't be caught off guard or misunderstand it. It's important to be grateful that Jesus shared this knowledge with us so openly and honestly. People ask, are we in the end times? The Bible speaks of the last days, a period that has lasted for 2,000 years since the prophecy was fulfilled at Pentecost. The Bible is full of predictions, with 735 prophecies about the future in one quarter of its chapters. It is a prophetic text from start to finish, although some books focus more on predictions than others. According to scripture prediction, 596 out of 735 prophecies have already come true, equivalent to 81%. Some of these prophecies were made centuries ago and it is highly likely that the remaining 19% will also come true. The Bible has proven to be correct for every prediction that could have been fulfilled by now. The remaining prophecies are mostly concerned with the return of Jesus and the following events. How many of these predictions need to come true before the return of Jesus? The answer is approximately 20, and we must observe these events happening before we can anticipate the Lord's return. 
Jesus instructed us to remain watchful and prayerful. But what should we watch out for? We cannot just stand idle and gaze at the clouds waiting for him to appear. That's not what he meant. Instead, he meant that we should keep track of the happenings in the world and recognize the signs that he provided to help us prepare. Signals are the signs. In Matthew chapter 24, the disciples asked Jesus about the signs of his return. They wanted to know what to do if they didn't know when it would happen. Jesus gave a direct and clear answer, which we can be grateful for. In the book of Revelation, he provides a more detailed response. But in this chapter, he gave a brief summary of the signs that would precede his arrival. The disciples came to Jesus secretly while he was sitting on the Mount of Olives, and Jesus spoke about the abomination of desolation. What is this abomination, and when can we expect this? Jesus warned that an event would occur in the temple that would cause people to detest and feel disgust or hatred. This event would lead to complete emptiness or destruction, also known as desolation. When this happens, the residents of Judea should seek cover without delay. Different translations refer to this event as the abomination that causes desolation, the sacrilegious object that causes desecration, or that horrible thing. The Amplified Bible explains that the abomination of desolation is the appalling sacrilege that astonishes and makes desolate. Jesus referenced Daniel in his words in the Olivet Discourse. During a particular moment, Daniel had a realization that the 70 years of captivity were about to end. While he was praying, Gabriel, who was caused to fly swiftly, arrived at that moment, around the time of the evening sacrifice. Gabriel informed Daniel that he was greatly beloved, which was a tremendous tribute coming from God himself. He then gave Daniel an outline of the future history of the Jewish nation, using the figure of 70 weeks. Each week represented seven years. The prophet Daniel mentioned the abomination of desolation in three places. Regardless of whether the abomination of desolation is a person or thing, Daniel predicted the following. First, in the future a leader will make a treaty with the people of Israel. Second, the duration of this treaty will be one week which we take to be a period of seven years. Third, halfway through this period, the king will gather his army and put an end to the sacrifices and offerings in the temple. Fourth, during that time, the ruler will profane the temple by placing an abomination in it. Fifth, the desecration of the temple will continue until God's judgment falls upon the ruler and his followers. 1290 days, three and a half years and one month later. Those who do not worship the image of the beast will face the Antichrist's wrath. Those who refuse to bow the knee to the Antichrist in the beast's image may face persecution on earth, but they will be rewarded in heaven. But what exactly is this image of the beast? There are different beliefs about what the image of the beast could be. Some people think it might be a statue or a picture that appears to come to life and speak. Others believe it could be a supercomputer, holograms, human clones, a cyborg, or superhuman artificial intelligence. It may surprise you to know that this concept has been around for over a thousand years and is still present in our world today. An image is a likeness or resemblance, not an exact copy. Those that do not take the mark will reign during the millennium with Jesus. After Jesus comes back down from heaven, he will actually set up this whole new kingdom. Jesus will reign for 1,000 years and he will bound the devil for only 1,000 years. Revelation 20 speaks in detail concerning the final state of Satan and unbelievers. Verse 7 remarks that at the end of the thousand-year millennial kingdom, the saints live and reign for a thousand years. And then I saw thrones, and sitting on them were those to whom judgment, that is the authority to act as judges, was given. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony of Jesus and because of the word of God and those who had refused to worship the beast or his image, and had not accepted his mark on their forehead and on their hand. And they came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. Revelation 20, 4. Who sits on these thrones? Perhaps the 24 elders representing the church or the apostles or the company of saints as a whole. This could be the judging of angels talked about in 1 Corinthians 6, verses 2-3. However, it's more likely that these saints are in charge here on earth. These saints will rule with Jesus for the same time that Satan is locked up, 1,000 years. They help run the kingdom of Jesus Christ on earth, overseeing those who move from the troubles of the Great Tribulation to the peace of the millennium. 
Everyone who wins with Jesus will rule and reign with him. 1 Corinthians 6 verses 2 through 3 Do you know that the saints, God's people, will one day judge the world? If the world is to be judged by you, are you not competent to try trivial and significant petty cases? Do you not know that we believers will judge angels? How much more than as to matters of this life? Why does John only mention the tribulation saints? These people are mentioned to encourage them and show that others won't be forgotten. This is a special recognition for those who suffered during the tribulation. They faced great pain from the Antichrist who claimed, I will rule the earth. Now these faithful believers hold power while the Antichrist is defeated. These martyrs are real people, but they also stand for everyone who gives their lives for Jesus. The term beheaded means more than we might realize. The ancient Greek word actually means executed. It looks like worshiping the Antichrist is connected to receiving the mark, and anyone who refuses to worship the image of the beast will be killed. Many of those who sleep in the dust of the ground will awake, resurrect, these to everlasting life, but some to disgrace and everlasting contempt, abhorrence. Everyone will be brought back to life from the dead, but not everyone will have the same future. The New Testament shows that there are different resurrections for the good people and the bad people. Revelation 20 talks about a first resurrection and says the people who are part of it are blessed and holy. The rest of the dead, the non-believers, did not come to life again until the thousand years were completed. This is the first resurrection, blessed, happy, prosperous to be admired, and holy is the person who takes part in the first resurrection. Over these, the second death, which is eternal separation from God, the lake of fire has no power or authority, but they will be priests of God and of Christ, and they will reign with him a thousand years. Revelation 20, verses 5 through 6. The second death, which is the lake of fire, has no power over these people. Then death and Hades, the realm of the dead, were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire, the eternal separation from God. Revelation 20, 14. The first resurrection is when all believers are raised. It matches with what Jesus taught about the resurrection of the just and the resurrection of life. John 5, 29. And they will come out. Those who did good things will come out to a resurrection of new life, but those who did evil things will come out to a resurrection of judgment that is to be sentenced. John 5.29 The first resurrection happens in different steps. Jesus Christ himself, called the first fruits, made the way for the resurrection of everyone who believes in him. First, there will be the resurrection of the dead in Christ when the Lord comes back, and then the resurrection of the martyrs at the end of the tribulation. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a shout of command, with the voice of the archangel and with the blast of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. 1 Thessalonians 4.16 At the end of the tribulation, the saints from the Old Testament will also be raised. They are part of the first resurrection. Revelation 20 verses 12-13 talks about those in the second resurrection. These are the wicked people who will be judged by God at the great white throne judgment before they are thrown into the lake of fire. And I saw the dead, the great and the small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Then another book was opened, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged according to what they had done as written in the books, that is, everything done while on earth. And the sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades, the realm of the dead, surrendered the dead who were in them, and they were judged and sentenced, every one according to their deeds. Revelation 20, verses 12-13. The second resurrection is when all unbelievers are raised. The second resurrection is tied to the second death. It matches what Jesus taught about the resurrection of judgment. And they will come out. Those who did good things will come out to a resurrection of new life. But those who did evil things will come out to a resurrection of judgment that is to be sentenced. John 5, 29. The event that separates the first and second resurrections seems to be the millennial kingdom. The last of the righteous will be raised to reign with Christ four thousand years, but the rest of the dead, the wicked, will not live again until the thousand years are over. There will be a great joy at the first resurrection. There will be great sorrow at the second. What a huge responsibility we have to share the gospel. Save others, snatching them out of the fire and on some have mercy, but with fear, loathing even the clothing spotted and polluted by their shameless immoral freedom. Jude 23 Does the mark of the beast exist today? Many of us wonder if the mark of the beast in Revelation will be a high-tech tattoo or the plan of a billionaire. The Bible makes it very clear what the mark is and when it will happen. 
To begin, there is a strict timing requirement for the mark. Scripture teaches that the mark of the beast will appear at a particular time and place in history, but at this point in time, we have not yet arrived at that time or place. The reason why the mark of the beast is referred to as the mark of the beast is because it is brought into being by a man who is referred to as the beast. So until the Antichrist is in charge of the whole world, there can't be a mark. The Bible says that the beast and his mark don't show up on earth until halfway through the seven year tribulation. So the mark can't be around in any form before the tribulation starts. Because of this, any talk about the mark of the beast being here today is just a warning sign. Many seem to be confused because they do not understand the book of Revelation. However, what if there is an animation showing the entire book? Well, we created that. And to watch that, click here. When they are revealed, the great tribulation will begin. The Bible speaks of a strange prophecy called the tribulation. During these times, the world will experience the strangest judgments and natural changes. The truth is that many are afraid of this time because the Lord will judge the unbelieving and godless people on earth. But how will these times be introduced? How do we know when these tribulations begin? The Bible talks about two human people who will rule during these tribulation times. The question is, are these leaders already alive? If these people are alive, it means the tribulation is fast approaching. Therefore, we need to identify these two heralds. The first person is the Antichrist. This man shows up as what I call the spirit of the Antichrist. This spirit is different from the single person known as the Antichrist. It is also different from the many Antichrists who have appeared throughout history. That is why John's teachings give us a clear understanding of this spirit and these individuals. Children, it is the last hour, the end of this age. And just as you heard that the Antichrist is coming, the one who will oppose Christ and attempt to replace him, even now many Antichrists, false teachers, have appeared, which confirms our belief that it is the last hour. They went out from us, seeming at first to be Christians, but they were not really of us because they were not truly born again and spiritually transformed. For if they had been of us, they would have remained with us, but they went out teaching false doctrine so that it would be clearly shown that none of them are of us. But you have an anointing from the Holy One. You have been set apart, specially gifted and prepared by the Holy Spirit. And all of you know the truth because he teaches us, illuminates our minds and guards us from error. I have not written to you because you do not know the truth, but because you do know it, and because no lie, nothing false, no deception is of the truth. Who is the liar but the one who denies that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, the Anointed? This is the Antichrist, the enemy and antagonist of Christ, the one who denies and consistently refuses to acknowledge the Father and the Son. Whoever denies and repudiates the Son does not have the Father. The one who confesses and acknowledges the Son has the Father also. 1 John 2, 18 through 23. But you may ask, the word Christ is in his name. Is that not a good thing? So let me explain. The word Christ comes from the Greek word Christos, which is related to the Hebrew word Mashiach, meaning Messiah. So when we say Antichrist, we refer to someone or something that is against the Messiah. Not everyone understands who he really is. It will be tough to resist him because he represents what the world loves. This is because the Antichrist will seem charming, successful, and may even look like an angel of light. But in reality, he will be a false messiah, not the true messiah, who is Jesus Christ. However, many may say, this has already happened. This is true. In 1 John 2.18, the author talks about the Antichrist and many Antichrists. This means there is a spirit tied to the Antichrist that will help him rise up. This lets us know that there have been many antichrists in the past. The reason we must identify this particular individual is because he will lead people in a rebellion against God during the end times. Therefore, while the world waits for the true antichrist to show himself, we can already see signs of him and his mission through the smaller antichrists. But this man's name is not limited in any form. The Bible gives the coming world leader many names or titles, including the man of lawlessness and the son of perdition. 2 Thessalonians 2.3 No one is to deceive you in any way, for it will not come unless the apostasy comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction. 
Because there is a spirit of the Antichrist, we can be confident that as we get closer to the end of this age, the spirit of the Antichrist will become stronger and we will see it more and more. But you may be confused with the several false alarms regarding the identity of the Antichrist. This is why John has made it clear what the spirit of the Antichrist is. You see, John lets us know the main thing about this spirit is that it says Jesus is not the Messiah. In 1 John 2.22, it asks, Who is a liar but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ? The Antichrist denies both the Father and the Son. This spirit does not accept that the Messiah has come already, even if it thinks a Messiah will come in the future. Because of the huge impact of this figure and the great prophecies about him, many may believe that this person will not be flesh and blood. But the Bible proves this wrong there is a person known as Antichrist. And the dragon, Satan, stood on the sandy shore of the sea. Then I saw a vicious beast coming up out of the sea with ten horns and seven heads, and on his horns were ten royal crowns, diadems, and on his heads were blasphemous names. And the beast that I saw resembled a leopard, but his feet were like those of a bear, and his mouth was like that of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power and his throne and great authority. I saw one of his heads, which seemed to have a fatal wound, but his fatal wound was healed, and the entire earth followed after the beast in amazement. They fell down and worshipped the dragon because he gave his authority to the beast. They also worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like, as great as the beast, and who is able to wage war against him? Revelation 13, 1-4 in the book of Revelation, we see a lot of visions that need interpretation. This is why we see the Antichrist as a symbol. John sees a symbol of the beast coming up from the sea. This beast is different from the dragon, which represents Satan, but it is closely linked to him. The beast has seven heads and ten horns, just like the dragon. John says this beast will be a person who gets power from Satan. This power will help him control all of humanity and persuade everyone to worship Satan. This is a plan Satan has been working on for many years. In the vision, a statue of the beast is made and everyone is told to worship it. Throughout history, people have often bowed down to images of powerful leaders. The beast is also called the Antichrist or the son of perdition, just like Judas. But this leader does not work independently. He is empowered and supported by Satan. Through this man, Satan will express his desire and authority. In this, the beast takes the offer that Jesus refused. The Beast and His Wound And I saw one of his heads as if it had been mortally wounded, and his deadly wound was healed. And all the world marveled and followed the beast. The beast's recovery is mentioned twice later in Revelation 13.12 and 13.14 in connection with the world's worship and devotion to the beast. As a result, his fame and authority increase, and all the world marvels and follows the beast. Revelation 13, 12, he exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence, and he makes the earth and those who live on it worship the first beast, whose fatal wound was healed. We read the terms wounded, healed, but we know why people will be infatuated with the Antichrist. He will pretend to be like Jesus by dying and coming back to life. This particular act will make him very famous and powerful because people will think he can't be defeated. The Antichrist's power and popularity will amaze everyone. This is why we have a great prophecy from Daniel. Daniel says this person will be a great speaker who uses fancy words but will also speak badly about God. The Antichrist will look more impressive than anyone else. Many people will find him attractive because of his charm, smooth talking, and good looks. He will start as a local leader and grow into a world leader, becoming a cruel ruler. And finally, he will act like a god. Revelation 13, 5 through 6. A mouth was given to him, speaking arrogant words and blasphemies, and authority to act for 42 months was given to him. And he opened his mouth in blasphemies against God, to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle, that is, those who dwell in heaven. Blasphemer may be a more accurate title than Antichrist for this end times dictator. This individual is someone who speaks out against God and opposes everything that God represents, including his name, his dwelling place, and the inhabitants of heaven. 
A lot of Christians may be ready to handle a week or two of discomfort, but the Antichrist will rule for a lot longer. The Bible tells us that, and he was given authority to continue for 42 months. According to biblical prophecy, the beast will be allowed to act without restraint for 42 months, which is equivalent to three and a half years. The beast makes war against the saints. Revelation 13, 7. It was also given to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them, and authority was given to him over every tribe, people, language, and nation. The government of the beast will persecute and extinguish all those who do not bow and worship to the beast. The Antichrist will not be alone. There will come another one with a much more diabolical power. The second of these individuals that must show up during the tribulation is the false prophet. The world has seen many false prophets, like the prophets of Baal who faced Elijah on Mount Carmel, and cult leader David Koresh. The Bible tells us there will be even more false prophets in the future. During the second half of the tribulation, Satan will give power to a false prophet who will trick people into worshiping the Antichrist. We don't know when the rapture and tribulation will happen, but the false prophet might be living among us today. You may think that it will be easy for the world to reject this ultimate evil man, but the Bible lets us know that the false prophet will seem likable. Revelation 13, 11, And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. In verse 11, a second beast appears, and he represents the false prophet. This beast, with the meekness of a lamb, will persuade the world that he is a reasonable, humble, and likable individual. But his gentle exterior will only serve to conceal his true nature, a predator with the ferocity of a dragon. He will be the consummate fulfillment of Jesus' warning in Matthew 7:15. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. The false prophet will be allied with the Antichrist and Satan. We truly are fighting a great spiritual evil. This evil is totally organized. And that is why when the Antichrist and the false prophet appear on the global stage, Satan will form an unholy trinity. In the same way that the Holy Spirit leads people to Jesus Christ, the false prophet will lead people to worship the Antichrist. And mimicking the relationship between God the Father and Jesus Christ, the Antichrist will receive his power and authority from Satan. This blasphemous trio will control every aspect of society and seek to steal God's glory. The Antichrist and the false prophet are prominently featured in Revelation, with the former emphasizing politics and the latter emphasizing religion. In the absence of the church, the unholy trinity will establish false doctrines to strengthen the Antichrist's political power. Throughout history, Satan has used this strategy. When there is a spiritual vacuum, political power marries itself to false religion in order to gain acceptance. Even secular belief systems are inextricably linked to religion. Their religion is anti-God, but it is still a faith system. During the Great Tribulation, Satan will use religion to bring the world together under the Antichrist's leadership. That is why the false prophet will perform miracles. The false prophet will counterfeit God's miracles by calling down fire from heaven. Revelation 13:13, 13, 13, and he doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. In the Old Testament, calling down fire from heaven was often used to execute God's judgment. Fire and brimstone fell on Sodom and Gomorrah in Genesis 19:24. Then the Lord rained upon Sodom and upon Gomorrah brimstone and fire from the Lord out of heaven. In Leviticus 10, 1 through 2, fire consumed Aaron's sons when they violated God's commands. Leviticus 10, 1 through 2, And Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, took either of them his censer, and put fire therein, and put incense thereon, and offered strange fire before the Lord, which he commanded them not. And there went out fire from the Lord, and devoured them, and they died before the Lord. Elijah triumphed over the prophets of Baal when the fire of the Lord fell from heaven and consumed his sacrifice. 1 Kings 18.38 But like the kings of old, a spiritual authority is always needed, and that is why the false prophet will be present. The false prophet has ultimate earthly authority over spiritual matters, will supervise the construction of an image for worshiping the Antichrist. Although scripture does not specify the image, it is likely to be a large structure rather than an effigy on a coin or other similar symbol. 
it will serve as a meeting place for those who worship the Antichrist. Regardless of the specifics, the image will appear to be alive. The false prophet will consolidate power through the mark of the beast. While the mark of the beast is frequently associated with the Antichrist, it will be driven by the false prophet. A king needs submission, and the Antichrist is no different. He will require and demand submission from the world. That is why, to demonstrate their allegiance to the Antichrist, he will require every man and woman to wear a seal on their hand or forehead. This marking will be a demonic substitute for the seal God's angels placed on the 144,000 Jewish evangelists in Revelation 7.3 in yet another counterfeiting attempt. Revelation 7.3, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. In a world controlled by Satan, the mark of the beast will weld absolute power. He will be like the empires of old. Did you know that the term mark refers to the Roman use of a seal associated with the emperor that conveyed official sanction? The Antichrist also needs to know those that are for and against him. That is why those who do not bear the beast's mark will be considered traitors and will be boycotted by the beast's commercial system. Those who do not have the seal will be denied the ability to purchase what they require, causing them to perish as a result of exposure, starvation, or illness. This system will be permanent during the beast's reign. Without the beast's mark, all the money in the world will not be enough to buy bread. Those who refuse to take the beast's mark will not be the only ones to suffer. Everyone who takes the mark will be spared the beast's wrath, but they will drink of the wine of God's wrath. Revelation 14.10 Revelation 14, 9-11 A third angel followed them and said in a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and its image and receives its mark on their forehead or on their hand, they too will drink the wine of God's fury, which has been poured full strength into the cup of his wrath. They will be tormented with burning sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and of the Lamb, and the smoke of their torment will rise forever and ever. There will be no rest, day or night, for those who worship the beast and its image, and for anyone who receives the mark of its name. Receiving the beast's mark will provide temporary relief. However, when its bearers face an eternity of suffering, this brief respite will be of little comfort. The false prophet's number is 666. The infamous number 666 is one of the most perplexing aspects of the beast and his mark. Revelation 13, 18. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is 603 score and six. This prophecy is not the clearest, and that is why this number has led to a lot of guesses and ideas. For example, it first appears in the Bible in verse 18, which adds up to six plus six plus six. Goliath was six cubits tall, weighed six shekels, and wore six pieces of armor. In Daniel, Nebuchadnezzar's statue was 60 cubits tall and 6 cubits wide, with 6 instruments calling people to worship. These details are interesting, but they don't explain what the beast's number means. When we multiply that number, 666, it might show how incredibly clever the beast is as a human. He represents the height of human achievement without God. No matter how good man gets, he will always fall short of God's perfection, just as 6 is always less than 7. Whatever 666 means, the mark of the beast symbolizes man's effort to make himself great, even godlike, as a final act of defiance against God. During the Great Tribulation, man's kingdom will take over instead of God's kingdom. This is a strange prophecy to reflect on. A man with the number 666 will appear on the world stage for a few brief moments before being judged by God. Neither the false prophet nor the Antichrist, like a song without a final note, can bring history to a close. Only the true God, through the Lord Jesus Christ, is capable of doing so. He is a perfect seven, as are all who find eternal refuge in him. Why did Jesus refer to this time of the Antichrist and the false prophet as the tribulation? Do we know how long it will last for? Will Christians be there and will they experience the tribulation? The tribulation lasts for seven years. This is based on the 70 weeks mentioned in the book of Daniel. The Great Tribulation is the last half of this period, lasting three and a half years. It's different from the Tribulation because during this time, the Beast, also known as the Antichrist, will be revealed, and God's anger will become much stronger. 
It's important to understand that the terms tribulation and great tribulation do not mean the same thing. In eschatology, which is the study of end times, the tribulation refers to the entire seven years, while the great tribulation specifically means the second half of that time. Jesus is the one who talked about the great tribulation when speaking about the last half of a tough time to come. In Matthew 24, 21, he says, For then there will be a great tribulation, such as has not occurred since the beginning of the world until now, nor ever shall. Then in Matthew 24, 29 through 30, Jesus adds, Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the Son of Man will appear in the sky, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. In this part, Jesus explains that the Great Tribulation starts with the revealing of the Antichrist and ends with his return. Other parts of the Bible also mention the Great Tribulation. For example, Daniel 12 says, And there will be a time of distress, such as has never occurred since there was a nation until that time. Jeremiah 37 also talks about the Great Tribulation, saying, Alas, for that day is great, there is none like it. And it is the time of Jacob's distress, but he will be saved from it. Jacob's distress refers to the nation of Israel, which will face hardships and disasters like never before. In Daniel 9, 26 through 27, we learn that the Antichrist will make a seven-year peace agreement with the world. Halfway through this time, or in the middle of the week, he will break this agreement. He will stop the sacrifices and offerings in a future rebuilt temple. Revelation 13, 1 through 10 gives us more details about the Antichrist. Revelation provides the most insight about the Great Tribulation. From Revelation 13, when the beast appears, until Jesus returns in Revelation 19, we see God's anger against the earth because of disbelief and rebellion, Revelation 16 through 18. At the same time, God shows his love by disciplining and protecting his people Israel, Revelation 14, 1 through 5 until he fulfills his promise to them by creating an earthly kingdom, Revelation 20, 4 through 6. Throughout the Bible, the tribulation is connected to the day of the Lord. This is when God steps in to carry out his plans for the world. It's called tribulation in the latter days, Deuteronomy 4, 30, and includes the great tribulation, which is the tougher second half of a seven-year period. Daniel 9, 24 through 27 tells us about the purpose and timing of the tribulation. This passage talks about 70 weeks that have been set for your people. Daniel's people are the Jews, the nation of Israel. In Daniel 9, 24, God shares his plan to finish transgression, to put an end to sin, to atone for wickedness, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. God says that 70 sevens will accomplish all these things. The sevens represent groups of years, so 70 sevens equals 490 years. However, God will also send his two men, the two witnesses, a description of two people who will assist in carrying out the work that God has for them to do during the time of the tribulation can be found in Revelation 11, 3 through 12. And I will grant authority to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy for 1260 days, 42 months, three and one half years, dressed in sackcloth. These witnesses are the two olive trees and the two lampstands, which stand before the Lord of the earth. And if anyone wants to harm them, fire comes out of their mouth and devours their enemies. So if anyone wants to harm them, he must be killed in this way. Revelation 11, 3 through 5. At the beginning of the church age, John on Patmos is the prophet. At the end, there will be two witnesses who will prophesy in the city of Jerusalem. There is a sense of impending disaster in the spectacular appearance of these two mighty men. Between the sixth and seventh trumpets, attention is focused on the human channels through which the divine revelations are communicated. The key word in both chapters is prophesy. Revelation 10, 11. Then I was told, you must prophesy again about many peoples, nations, languages, and kings. The verse reads, my two witnesses. This introduces two more interesting characters of Revelation, the two witnesses. The nature of their ministry is prophetic, as evidenced by the fact that they will prophesy. They preach and display repentance, as seen by their wearing sackcloth, and they have an effective ministry, as we read, I will give power. 
the two witnesses indeed served with power. Such power, in fact, that they can witness for 1260 days despite the world's antagonism. We also read, and if anyone wants to harm them, fire proceeds from their mouth and devours their enemies. God has given the two witnesses special protection, similar to Elijah. All of the nouns used to refer to the two witnesses in this passage are masculine in ancient Greek grammar. The two witnesses are two men. The two witnesses in the book of Revelation will have miraculous powers to accompany their message, and no one will be able to stop them in their work. Revelation 11.6, Amplified Bible. These two witnesses have the power from God to shut up the sky so that no rain will fall during the days of their prophesying regarding judgment and salvation. And they have power over the waters, seas, rivers, to turn them into blood and to strike the earth with every kind of plague as often as they wish. The two witnesses will have miraculous power, but they will be killed when their testimony is concluded. The wicked world will rejoice, allowing the bodies of the fallen prophets to lie in the streets. Revelation 11, 7 through 10. When they have finished their testimony and given their evidence, the beast that comes up out of the abyss, bottomless pit, will wage war with them and overcome them and kill them. And their dead bodies will lie exposed in the open street of the great city, Jerusalem, which in a spiritual sense is called by the symbolic and allegorical names of Sodom and Egypt, where also their Lord was crucified. Those from the peoples and tribes and languages and nations look at their dead bodies for three and a half days and will not allow their dead bodies to be laid in a tomb. And those non-believers who live on the earth will gloat over them and rejoice, and they will send gifts and celebration to one another, because these two prophets tormented and troubled those who live on the earth. And their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. The term as Sodom speaks of immorality, and the term as Egypt speaks of oppression and slavery. Those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over them, make merry, and send gifts to one another. The earth saw and triumphed over the deaths of the two witnesses. It is possible that the fact that people see this of all peoples, tribes, tongues, and nations is an indirect foreshadowing of how current mass media works. It is incredible, and not far-fetched at all, to think of a live, worldwide broadcast on new channels and over the internet to see the fantastic scene described here. The idea is also that the world treats these two witnesses humiliatingly. To have his dead body lie in view of all was the worst humiliation a person could suffer from his enemies. Johnson. The preaching of these two witnesses and their call to repentance was a torment for many because they could not stand to hear the truth while they loved their lie. Their bodies will lie in the streets for just over three days while the transnational mass, tormented in conscience by their expressions, gloat over and celebrate their removal. When the two are resurrected in full view of everyone, the relief will turn to terror. Their ascension will be triggered by a loud voice from heaven saying, come up here. The reviving of the two witnesses. Revelation 11, 11 through 12, Amplified Bible. But after three and a half days, the breath of life from God came into them and they stood on their feet and great fear and panic fell on those who were watching them. And the two witnesses heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, come up here. Then they ascended into heaven in the cloud and their enemies watched them. Because the earth was unworthy of these two witnesses, God simply summoned them and they ascended to heaven in a cloud. We read the phrase, come up here. The earth was not worthy of these two witnesses, so God simply called them home and they ascended to heaven in a cloud. It is clear that the masses always fail to listen to the prophets of God. In the same hour, there was a great earthquake. An earthquake brings judgment and inspires many to praise God, but it remains to be seen whether this will result in genuine repentance leading to salvation. When people leave the city, a strong earthquake will have already destroyed one-tenth of the buildings there and slain 7,000 of the city's inhabitants. It is impossible to ignore the startling similarities between the deaths of the two witnesses and that of Jesus. It will be impossible to avoid thinking about the crucifixion, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus Christ that took place. Of course, there are differences. In this case, the earthquake coincided with his death, and the general public witnessed neither his resurrection after three days, nor his ascension. 
it will result in fear of and glory to God. Matthew 27, 51, Amplified Bible. And at once the veil of the Holy of Holies of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook and the rocks were split apart.